Pete Yost here for the Unbuild It podcast. Our sponsor for this episode is our steadfast partner, Huber Engineered Woods. But the big news is you need to join Huber at the Journal of Light Construction Live New England event, August 13th and 14th. The Huber Engineered Woods booth is 241. You can go to the booth to test your building science knowledge and win some really cool prizes. You should also check out Huber's Prove It Tour trailer, where you can check in with product experts and interact with hands-on demonstrations. You can learn about the latest Huber and innovations at Vantech X Factor, X Accord MGO board, and Zip System vapor permeable tape. And finally, you should check out live demonstrations by Mike Sloggett at the Builder Workshop number 140 on Friday and Saturday. So don't forget, check out Huber at the Journal of Light Construction Live New England show, August 13th and 14th. Welcome to the Unbuilded Podcast. I'm Jake Bruton. Today I am joined by Peter Yost. Hey! And Steve Basic. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> For those of you listening, Steve's adjusting his, his cap United States Marine Corps hat. Uh, he's well, I'm wearing for, it in protest, if you've heard the above-grade walls. He's forgetting that these are publishing weeks apart, potentially, and everybody okay. else has forgotten. Go listen to he... the above-grade walls and listen to how Jake bashed our military on <laughs> in protest. And it starts with that, and if I don't defend myself, it's just that. It's just, yeah, Jake must have said something poor about the military. <laughs> <clears throat> and so this is uh, number three in a little mini series of podcasts that Ooh, we're doing. A mini here. series, I love it. It's mini like a series. series. I've never it's been more. in a mini series. Have you been in a mini series? I've never been in a mini series. No series. lifetime movies for no you guys. Is this this like week, mini on me, lifetime. Is Meredith Baxter mm-hmm. Bernie. I had a friend that was in a movie. I did have a friend. And so now, how many people have clicked off to see something else? <laughs> you know what? I am going to watch that thing about people dressing their dogs up like bumblebees. <laughs> I don't know where you get this. You should place. visit bdogs.com, B-dogs. by the way. I don't know if it's still up, but that was my favorite website for many years. Uh, today, we are going to talk about roofs. Woofs. Woofs. Roofs. Roofs. Bumblebee dogs and woofs. The roof. The roof. See, get the reference the there, Peter. The roof, roof is on roof. fire. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm not Karaoke quite sure night. who to look at right now because you're both <laughs> totally off the wall. <laughs> So we told oh, you're off the wall and right, on to the roof. The I get it. I so get we it. talked about below grade. We talked about above grade walls. And now we're going to talk about how we cap off, how we finish, how we terminate at, at, at the top. Yeah. And so where does this conversation start? Oh, let's, I know exactly where it starts. To vent or not to vent. That is the decision. I'm going to say no, it's not. Let's just vent it and be done with it. Can we Ooh. stop arguing I'm not about arguing. it? Who's arguing? I was an arguing. <clears throat> it's an easy one for me. I mean, you and I agree on this completely. Yes. We vent as much as we possibly can. Vent until you can't vent. Yep. Is what I always say. And then when you can't, do it wisely. Good design prevents problems to begin with. That's the very shortest uh, yep. Thanks for listening. we've ever had. Thanks for listening wow. today. All right. Hey, that's a wrap. Great job. So, are you saying that we vent attics or vent roofs or vent both? I would like the back side of my roof sheeting to be ventilated. You would like the back side of your roof sheeting to be ventilated. Okay, so that means that you're trying to increase the drying potential. But so, that, even in a cathedral ceiling, I'm still venting that that assembly if possible. But so we jumped. At the very beginning of roofs to protecting them from getting wet and helping them dry. So aren't we starting at the very end of our four control layer approach as opposed to starting at no, the beginning? water management's the first one. We're managing water with that. It just well, might be no, in a different... No, you're being sneaky. That's a stretch. He's being sneaky. <laughs> I'm with you, Peter. But military boundaries. as you know, when we were talking about foundations... We said all these conversations that we're going to have are after the thing doesn't fall down, code, code or your engineer is going to keep you from making it fall down. All of the conversations we're about to have about roofs are, well, this is after the fact that it is properly sloped, properly drained, and the shingles or the, or the metal or whatever the roofing material is, is properly installed, obviously, right? Like 
it, it seems silly that we would have that the conversation start at that point, but okay, there's no holes in it that are leaking. Now what do we do with a roof? Right? Yeah. I agree. Okay. We're in the business of not building leaky roofs, obviously. Okay. Good. I love right? it. So water management is a given when it comes to roofs. And when we talk about water management, so this is all climates, all slopes, uh, all configurations. We're going we're gonna to make sure that we bulk water manage and there's not going to be any air leakage. And we're going to add drying potential by venting. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm Which right is, there. is that not the same conversation? Well, we have, we have some air leakage because in the roof attic assembly, we want to make sure that our condition space is inside the air barrier or our air management system to the attic. So we don't want the attic to communicate with our interior condition space. So we do have a barrier there. Unless we're doing a conditioned attic. Unless we're doing a conditioned attic. But if you're doing a conditioned attic, you still have a barrier system. You just moved it mm -hmm. from the flat to the slope. Yep. So it's actually one of those things that, like, we have this conversation with people that build in the south all the time. They're just like, no, we, we open cell phone the whole thing, you know. And, okay, but why wouldn't you still just go ahead and include vent chutes on the top side of that and and have a vented assembly and a cathedral ceiling that you didn't put drywall on? Because that's my cathedral ceiling is an insulated vault that has vent chutes on the top side of it. So I have a vented space, the code minimum. Obviously, you haven't been to Dallas. <laughs> well. Because the problem is, is those roofs aren't the, like. It's you, not a peak. It's you, not drive, a you drive around Missouri and everything is a straight gable for 40 feet. And there's a gable end and a gable end and two eaves on a ranch. So it's pretty easy. But the minute you introduce all these kind of traverse type roof frames into that gable and it's a nine and 12 and the house is 40 feet deep. It's a totally different yeah. roof system than sure. just putting roof channels up through there. You're going to run into some valleys, and, and, valleys and, and it's going to become. So maybe we should stop building disgusting looking houses too. Um, yeah. Well, we should just do that anyway. I think. <laughs> so there you go. I problem solved the building science problem. By asking mm -hmm. architects to not decide to have 35 different roof lines. You are a problem solver. I'll give you Thank that. You. That's what I do. It and it's goes. interesting. We it, Connecting this back to the below-grade walls, I said that one of the first things I go and check about water loads that the foundation sees is looking at the roof plan. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're looking down and it takes you five minutes to figure out where all the water is going, uh, it's probably a pretty complicated roof plan. You know what's pretty interesting about that comment? <clears throat> nope. Tell me. Okay, good. I will. Um, years ago, as a young architect, I learned early on, and I learned it obviously the hard way, but that's how we learn a lot of our lessons in life. But the minute you draw a floor plan, you need to step away and say, how do I put a roof on it? Mm. Right? Because one of the things that I get client sketches and and it's real easy to kind of disregard them because 99% of the time you look at the client and say, okay, I get it. The floor plan look looks good. Let me just ask you a really quick question. How do you put a roof on that? <laughs> it's a 90 foot long flat roof from front to back. That's yeah, the only pretty option. much. Like, you know, it's 60 foot square and it's just a flat roof that, <laughs> you know, we, we do it. But, but, it, but yeah, it, it makes sense. Like from a water a building science perspective, you look at the roof plan and say, where's the water go? And the same thing about, I look at a floor plan when I'm designing a building and say, where does the roof go? How does the roof go? Right. There's a lot of things that have to make sense. Like I, I just worked on one and I'm building the model and I kind of broke my own rule, but the main body of the house was 26 feet. The section of, um, intersecting body of the house was 24 feet. So when you bring the roof up, if they're the same pitch, this main roof sat nine inches above the lower one and it gets that little triangle. So now I have to sit there and say, okay, do I raise these plate heights and push that roof up? Do I change that pitch to a 10 or a 12 and get it steeper and higher up? And now the eaves don't really match. So there's this interplay, but it's, you know, when it comes to roofs, there's a, 
a big interplay. And from an aesthetic point of view, the roofs can really make a house or break a house. Yeah. And Steve, when you're working on uh, these configurations, do you, do you use SketchUp to sort of get a sense of the 3D? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And you know what I, mean? what I use SketchUp a lot for is I'll build the roof in 3D and then SketchUp, I have the ability to transfer that to a 2D drawing. So I can take that because some of them, when I was doing work for like Paladur and Artistic, mm -hmm. like we, we would go into communities that had um, covenants that required like the roof had to have a minimum of seven planes facing the street Good and Lord. the front elevation had to have a minimum of five different planes. Three of the planes had to be more than like a two foot are you serious? That's, that's they, disgusting. They have requirements? There, yes, for, yes. There's covenants never, in communities. This is the worst architectural review committee probably in history. There's, no, like listen, there's, there's, they'll publish a book, 30 pages, on all the covenants. I mean, it'll talk about sidewalk and all of this stuff, driveway, doors can't face. I, I, but, I'm flabbergasted. I've never heard that there, yeah. was, there was geometric complexity required no. from the front. And some of them require, like... I, I'm working on one now where they require a certain amount of stone to yeah, face well, the or masonry. I, I, that I has guess to that, face but the intentional street. complexity. Intentional in complexity. Plane. You had to have wow. a certain number of roof planes, and sometimes it was high, sometimes it was low. But those That's some the, communities want a, that broken up, yeah, coastlining yeah. roof that goes everywhere. That's when I wish that I was a, a billionaire and could just go in and buy it and just build the ugliest house. Just like, no, it has seven <laughs> roof planes. Just so happens that that one actually drains back towards the house. That one, those, and or it's a it's a, a Buckminster Fuller geodesic <laughs> dome. No, it has sixty five roof planes. Actually, <laughs> there you go. But yeah, no, there are there are communities out there that have covenants of different roof planes, wall planes, and how much they have to be displaced and. I motion yeah. to tell people to stop that. Anyone in favor? Oh, I second. Anyone second that? Okay, thank you. But uh, but yeah. So but getting back to roofs, yeah. There's uh, you know Joe used to do his famous crumple up a piece of paper, Frank throw Gary. it on the table table and say, okay, how do I vent that? Yeah, it's like you can't vent that, right? And that's one that was my reference to you know Dallas or some of these places that just have these complex roof systems that you can't, you really can't vent yeah. them. They become a challenge. So we we know that the adage that both of you follow is vent until you can't. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an interesting little experiment today in terms of, well, when can you de -de 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 <laughs> Alert. News Building flash. science alert. News flash. So because the, the code. No, we made history today. Let's, we did. So, so he's going to set the code straight. He's the code says, the says uh, that you're not supposed to vent anything under a 312. Right. Like it, it says that like the the recommended path is unvented assembly once we get below three twelve pitch, and the house that we're building together is a one twelve. It is a one and twelve roof, but it is a fully ventilated cross ventilated roof system, meaning that it is on, not only eave and ridge high to low, but it is. All the the entire rake system is open, so that we call that omnidirectional. Omnidirectional. And let's set some further context, which is there's a lot of rules about venting of attics and roofs that is based on ratios and numbers. The great talk about great references. There's a great book by Bill Rose called Water in Buildings, where he and Bill Rose is one of our building science historians. We don't have very many of those. But he traces through the history in the 1930s and 40s of where we get these numbers for ventilation ratios. And he says, basically, we just sort of made them up. And so when we talk about rules for venting, a lot of it's not based on actually testing to see what kind of flow we get. Because we know that what's the key is that we move air through that vent space to get drying potential. And so you, as a... Uh, bold architect said, we can vent 112. And I have to admit, it was like, I'm well, what's really interesting sure, is, I mean, a couple of months ago, you were at my house, we broke out the tools and we played around with venting. And I have a two and a, two and a half and 12 roof that it vented perfectly well, too. It did. So, how do we, how do we test that? Well, so, um, 
That's a really good question because you're looking at a wing nut and, you know, the thing about a wing nut is that codes and rules and labs are not really that, that important. So you, but what's important is that we actually go out in the field and see what kind of flow we can get. So when you I brought thought, this up, I thought you were going to convince one of us to, like, fart at one end and everybody else was going to cram their face no against the ridge vent. I don't like fart jokes. Yeah, I, I don't know how we just got from being a wing nut to discussing farts. That was just like another big, really big leap. Yeah. But well, at um, least we're not bashing the military. <laughs> holy smokes! Uh, speaking of holy smokes, so there you go. go. Good we do go. go. Is we get a church candle I'm better than a church. <laughs> <laughs> from the parsonage, <laughs> from the we parsonage, we get a oh, large man, oh, man, oh, man. Uh, pat. What, isn't it? Is it called the Pascal candle? Isn't there? A, there's a name for like the large. When, when you're at a funeral, there's usually this large candle that's at the head of the casket. That we yeah, would see, you were raised Roman Catholic. I was yeah, raised Lutheran. Right. We don't have so, the big fat candles. I think it was called it was a Roman. I was Roman. A Roman, Roman, Roman. Roman. Anyway, I digress. But yes, yeah. you asked me, how can we measure the airflow? And I figured, well, let's take a theatrical fogger. Let's jam a hose up into the soffit and see what kind of airflow we get from soffit the ridge. Which is just and, visual air. You yeah. just made the air so that we can see it. Yeah, essentially. And so um, you and I have done some work on that together at uh, your house. I've worked on other ones, but I thought, hey, we're out of Jake's house that Steve designed. So when you did it, we didn't, we're not pressurizing the cavity so people know. We're setting that theatrical fogger underneath the vent and just blowing some theatrical air that is allowed to do whatever it wants to do. We're not jamming the pipe into the cavity, right? I guess we're, is my point. We're, yeah. we're not propelling the fog. We're we're making it available. We're making it available to the to the vent. But so uh, in the past, what we've done is timed how long it takes the fog at the soffit to get to the. Yeah. To the to the ridge, and just so you guys know, I'm kind of pissed that you had me in there doing window videos and stuff, and I missed the whole action. You will but... get to see it on YouTube oh, because great. we publish. Yeah, let me just watch the, the video. podcast publishes right, to I'll YouTube. Remember that. You get to see it. Good plug. Yeah, whatever. Good segue, Steve. Go yeah. ahead, Peter. We have video to prove that we got a 30 foot run to vent in 10 seconds from soffit to ridge. Well, tell the truth though, because I heard the real story from the people that were out there. You guys did but the take test. One, take one take was not one. 10 seconds. It, it was so quick. You weren't even ready to video. <laughs> he, was still, he was still talking to the camera and it's coming out. And it's coming him. out behind you. That's how fast it worked. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to go faster than 10 or like, I was like, oh, I wonder if this will take like 30 seconds. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll go a foot per second. We had to do a second yeah. take because the smoke went up the 112, much, the fog much, much more quickly than we anticipated. Yeah. So there you have it. I mean, we, this is, this, this is, I know we take it lightly. And we're, verify. Well, we take it lightly, but this is, I won't say historic, but this is really important. I mean, we, we physically tested a one in 12 roof and proved that in 10 seconds, air moved from soffit to ridge vent. And so the other question is why? I mean, why did it move? And we know that the sun came out not long before we did it, heated up the roof, exaggerated the stack effect from high to low, and the wind was blowing. And so if we have a driving force, it doesn't matter that it's 112. We can move air through it. So, And we should also note that the stack effect is how we're relying on all of the attic venting to happen. Yeah, and so... Which is why the steeper the pitch the more it works because there's more of an elevation change. Well, and, you know, we know that we can have gable to gable vents and the code allows that, but what's the driving force? Right. Yeah. And not for that's nothing. Why, that's if we why. did a 12 and 12 roof that was 30 feet long, I don't see the air coming out much quicker than 10 seconds. I mean, that was mm. pretty Sounds incredible. Pretty cool. I haven't fogged any, anyone what, except One of the one. questions I had that I wanted to discuss when we were, when we were driving back is, do you think the fact that it's a metal roof in lieu of an asphalt roof has any impact? That it absorbs a little bit more heat? Or if it's just a little warmer on the top side of that cavity to create an accelerated or stack Or it reacts quicker, too. Or There's less mass so, there. So yeah. the, the whole reason we started this testing was to find out the factors that do affect the flow rate. Because, frankly, the, code does, the codes 
doesn't care whether you have asphalt roofing shingles. Um, we know that the minimum depth is one inch, but we don't know, well, is three quarters okay or is an inch and a half? Better? Well, in this case, we have an inch and a half. so Which we know is pretty good now. Which we know is pretty darn good. And interesting, when I was talking to a guy at GAF, the technical guy, he put me in contact with a retired uh, researcher for GF who had over the years done a lot of testing, particularly on really long runs. And he said, yeah, I can't prove this, but over the years in looking at different depth of vent shoots, it seems like an inch and a half is a bit of a sweet spot. And that's pretty cool because that's a two by four. So the code says a minimum of one inch, but turns out that there's some evidence that an inch and a half is a, is a bit of a, a little better number. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, the assembly that we're talking about is truss frame roof with uh, OSB on the top of it, perforated throughout, and then overlay of two by four, and then a solid assembly OSB. It's zip sheathing in both cases, actually. And then uh, fully adhered membrane. Uh, I think we use shark skin. It's a uh, high temp rated, recommended by Sheffield, the, the manufacturer of the metal, and then metal roof. So it is a vented over roof. Yep. Right. We didn't just vent a one twelve truss assembly yeah. or anything. So it's a it's an OSB sandwich, if you will. Right. There's two layers of uh, there's a layer of OSB or do we use plywood? We actually used uh, five eight zip on both layers. Five eight zip. So we have five eight zip and then five eight zip with the, the inch and a half in between. But the five eight zip on the lower has a whole series of perfor you call them perforations, but they're like four or six by eight inch. Points communication ports, but it allows that air to communicate. And our two by fours are not totally continuous either. And our two by fours are not. So there's this kind of omnidirectional matrix that air in the lower layer of the attic can move about and go up any hole. But then once it goes up any hole, it's connected to the the rakes, the eave, the soffit, and it can move. So it's it's kind of like, I would liken it to an open joint rain screen. like. It's one yeah. of those things yeah. where if I give it the most amount of air, mentally you're going to say, oh, my God, that's going to fail because you're letting all this water and air in there. But really what I'm doing is upping the drying potential. And so in this roof, I would say we severely upped our venting potential. Absolutely. And it's interesting because when we think about comparing what are the drying potential needs for a roof as compared to a wall, well, it's pretty easy to argue that well, the roof sees a lot more water than the wall does. So shouldn't we be even more careful about providing it with, you know, a, a, a venting? Drying and it's interesting in the assembly that you described, that vent chute is actually providing drying potential to both the top and the lower sheathing layer, right? Yeah, it's basically a roof rain screen that <clears throat> yeah. we developed, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's basically we took. So this goes back to our comments where we talk about Mother Nature and the semantics of building. There's floor assemblies, wall assemblies, and roof assemblies. We, we, we've we talked in the past about taking our wall assembly and laying it down and using it as a floor assembly or laying it down so that the insulating sheathing. Well, in this case, we've taken our rain screen system and rotated it mm -hmm. to become a roof system. And mother nature's rules apply. If it works and vents there, then rotating it, it should vent too. So we're looking at um, Roofs 101, and we've talked about the drying potential. One of the things that's interesting, too, is that it's one of the few places where th there can be a serious separation between the water control layer and the air and thermal, right? Because they can, with an attic space, they can be pretty much totally yeah. disconnected. It's also the only place that like our, our water control layer is discontinuous. Like if you do that red line test for water control, it's like for me, it's a lot of times it's zip sheathing on the walls and then all of our foundation. Yeah, the lines kind of extend like, and go off like the this air. Horizontal soffit thing that's not really water control anymore, and it's just because we use an umbrella. It's just an umbrella right. at that point. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. I would make the argument, you know, vent until you can't vent anymore, and it's always going to be an umbrella rather than just a little rubber cap that has no brim on it, like. We're always going to shed water as best we can. Let's find a way to make a modern house with overhangs. In other words, like let's not let's not make an argument for no overhangs. You know, it's one can, of those things, though. I, I get it, and I and I 
want to agree with you. And, but you and, won't. Well, I'm not going to totally agree with you because the architect in me says there is some pretty cool aesthetic value in seeing that perfect cube of a house. Okay. So it, it might not be my style, but I can, I can appreciate it, I guess. But it gets back to our other points of if you're the designer or architect on that, and you're going to take the roof and just fold it over the wall and not have any overhang and put the window in the wall, then you need to heighten your awareness of how all of those holes that you punch in the wall, how they're flashed, how they're dealt with, yeah. and how they're water managed so that your intention is proportional to you know the consequences available. And that to just sit there and say, oh, I'm not going to put any roof overhangs on there and we'll just let you know, Joe Builder throw the windows in like he used to do or usually does, then that's failing the system, right? So we need you need to understand that you need to up your game. And then if you take that house and you put it on the coast, then you totally know, different conversation. It's a totally different conversation. So we can have uh we talked when we were talking about above grade walls, the relationship between the way we approach the design and climate. When we talk about venting roofs or configuring them to have the maximum drying potential, that's pretty much regardless of climate, right? If we can do it, we should do it. Yeah, I, think I so. agree. I agree. But, the, you know, it's to flip the coin on that, though, there are what I would call regional perspectives. Like if you go south, I know a lot of builders in the south that just they don't even consider a vented roof assembly. Mm -hmm. We'll just go up there and blow up and south. But they'll do a vented crawl space. But they'll do a vented crawl space. So go figure that. <laughs> it's like, I don't need to do it in the roof, but I need to do it down in the, where the ground can communicate with my short basement. Are there any circumstances where we have to think about um, possible disadvantages to providing ventilation in, in a roof assembly? I mean, there's probably an argument at like places that are laden with forest fires and Stuff like that. That yeah, it's pretty interesting. We were talking about um, uh, you know key people in the industry, and when you and I met um, Steve Quarles, who's from the University of California Berkeley and is now at the Institute for Business, Home and Safety, um, he's always been looking at that relationship between protecting structures from wildfire and protecting them from water damage. And when he came to Building Science Cor Science uh, Summer Camp. It was all to work with building scientists on how do we maximize drying potential, but also protect it from wildfire. All right. So how do you do that? Yeah. Well, so one of the ways is um, if you can keep burning embers out of the assembly, then um, that's the largest risk. So for both walls and roofs, if you provide screening that is robust enough to keep out it's called Meaning brands like and a embers. small enough aperture that it's below the burning ember it, point and, yeah, and durable. It's, it's the it's the gauge of the wire essentially that is critical in terms of keeping those brands out of those assemblies. I, I don't know why I just thought of this, but wouldn't it be pretty cool to do a roof out of ICFs? Like you could build it like an igloo. Maybe, yeah. I could I could see that. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> I wonder if there's a so you do like a factory. sixty foot diameter igloo and just if keep you, wrapping. If you ICFs. use ICFs and you've done a roof out of ICFs, or if you just see a reason to do that, please comment below. Yeah, <laughs> but sorry, it just still came to mind. Yeah, no, I, I, we should always be consistently thinking about ICFs. So another great resource for people who are looking to design durable buildings is the work that's been done at the Institute for Business and Home Safety. And I would assume the uh, Institute for Insulated Concrete Foundation. <laughs> yes. Okay. He made it. He said that, not me. It, weren't you the host of this session? And you are we drawing us down into there we go. insulated taking concrete? It, taking forms. it to a low, but, uh, lowest common denominator. But let, let's talk about insulating roof systems, <laughs> right? Because we we can if we vent roofs, then we're stuck with insulating pretty much on the flat or in the stud cap or in the rafter cavity, right? Mm -hmm. With having some kind of ventilation above it. 
Um, you know, one of the benefits that I always see people say, well, what, you know, why would you do a vented roof? Well, if I'm not doing anything crazy on the inside with volume ceilings, then, you know, blowing an R70 cellulose roof is a pretty inexpensive event. Right. It's relatively it, speaking, relatively speaking, costs. as far as insulation goes, it's like you pay the guy to come going from R50 to R70 is, you know, hundreds of dollars on a 2000 square foot. Well, house. as you say, it's an economic question. It's, you know, yep. what it boils down to. It's an economic question. But it's, it's also a lot harder to get R70 in the rafter. And it's a lot harder to get R70 in the rafter. But I have done some retrofits where we've you know, gusseted down a two by four from a two by eight roof mm -hmm. and turn that two by eight into a 14 inch cavity or whatever the case. So there, there's, there's ways to do it. You know, it's, it's like anything, if you throw enough money at it, you're going to be able to come up with a solution to do it. But uh, I've also done a roof retrofit where um, we've gone up on the roof and it was board sheeting because it was an older house. And we basically took stripes of the board out pretty much in about four to five foot increments. Hmm. And the roof was totally uninsulated in this house. And then we blew um, uh, spray foam, closed cell spray foam up and then down in the cavity and basically closed off. It was a shallow cavity, only like five and a half inches in this in this house but we were able we knew we were putting a new roof on and stuff on it so pulling up a couple of the the pine board sheathing so it was we finished to, underneath it was finished underneath with you know mm. the typical like horsehair plaster and stuff mm. it was an older home that we were trying to retrofit but it was a pretty neat way it worked out really great the builder the insulator everybody was happy it was very successful so that was an undented Roof we turned it, well, it was like a totally, let's call it air open yep. roof yep. assembly because there wasn't even insulation in it. And then we closed it down and turned it into... But then the same thing works. If we do what he just talked about, before we put the roof on, we put on strapping, we sheath it, and then we roof that. Yeah. And it, it, what's key here is that if you're going to eliminate the drying potential, then the air tightness becomes even more critical because you don't have the forgiveness of the... You know, drawing. vent until you can't, but don't think that venting's going to overcome air leakage, yeah. right? Yeah. Or you, that's water. a losing proposition. Or large amounts of bulk water either. Yeah. Absolutely. If you have a roof leak, it doesn't matter if it's vented most likely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I think you remember, but probably about two years ago, I had a project that was a retrofit project. And I remember sending you the photos. It was a, a two by 12 rafter roof and it just had um, fiberglass in there. It had some vent shoots in there. But half of the vent shoots went to skylights, which were an end dam yeah. to it. And I remember sending you the photos and you were like Creating intrigued because, loop well, right under the skylight where that mold. lateral blocking is, it was all mold, which yeah. it should be because you're taking all this moist air and running it right up there dead and, end. and to a dead end yeah. and feeding it. But the way we solved that was very much, it's it kind of... You know, th this this one in 12 roof and inspiration, every, you know, everything comes from experience. In that roof, the way we solved it was we laid two by fours on the flat. We put a second um, piece of sheathing on it. And then down at the soffit, we just cut out a four inch strip across mm -hmm. the whole soffit. So the vent that was in the soffit that existed could now go up and into the upper vented space. We just added a, another piece of subfascia. But then we were inside the house. We had all the drywall off. We just packed that whole cavity mm -hmm. with insulation. And so now we have a totally vented roof on the top side that's very similar to what we were talking. And it's a pretty shallow roof, too. It was probably a 3 and 12. And if you're putting sleepers stuff. on the top side in an assembly like that, you could just make a void right at the top, you know. Yeah, and that one was easy. We did a, you know, typical ridge vent yeah. at the top. So That makes sense. So we're... I know we already recapped once. We're venting until we can't. We're choosing our roof design as best we can and maybe trying to not build in the neighborhoods like Steve was talking about earlier where there's <laughs> geometric Architectural complexity required. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, God, is that not what's wrong with half the houses being built in the United States? Sorry, everybody that builds in those neighborhoods. If you listen, <laughs> thank you for being a listener. We respect you. <laughs> uh 
yes, no overhangs is okay if you're aware of what that what the consequence of that is and aesthetically it works. Well, I think the problem with saying no, don't do that is not really the the root cause of evil in that yeah. situation, right? The root cause of evil is the ignorance and not doing proper window flashing. Yeah. And, and there are tons and not of buildings. understanding that I've just raised the stakes by taking the roof off. That's the, the best way to put it. You right. just you just changed your risk substantially. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and uh, gable vents don't work because there's no elevation change to create stack effect. You, they they can work, but they don't work nearly as well. And they don't work because of stack effect. They work because of cross ventilation, if, if which you could be fine. Yeah, absolutely. we don't care how it dries as long. I think as it if dries. you probably had like if you did a tiny house and you're talking about uh, the length of house being 20 feet and maybe 20 feet wide with a simple gable and you put gable vents in, I would argue that we could probably do a wing nut test and that might work. The problem is is when you see a hat. 60 foot colonial and they have a little 18 inch by 24 inch gable vent here and here you know, 50, 60 feet apart, and they expect that to flood this attic well, with air. What a great way to wrap up by saying, we need to wing nut test gable to gable ventilation. I've never done it. Wow. I, I'm, I'm, let's go. Let's go. Close it down. We're going to go out and find some gable. We're going to go find it. And but uh, fog it. I will sit in the car while you knock on people's doors and go, is it okay <laughs> if I... If I have my wing nut hat on, yeah. people trust yeah, it'll be way me. Better we got this better. hunch that your roof... Is it really working properly? Do you mind if we climb up there and prove it? <laughs> we're gonna put we're gonna put one of the guys here inside. Do you have an access inside the house that <laughs> this guy wearing the marine hat? That's you can six trust spot. me. I have get, a wing nut hat up yeah. there. But uh, hey, one thing that we didn't touch on. Didn't you see the clipboard? It down, though? I have a clipboard. <laughs> like, hey, I, I just want to touch on it because I think it's really important. Attic catches, attic access. Mm -hmm. It's very important. We talked about air tightness. Yeah. But you really need to consider that those are the worst as hell, right? So you need to pay attention. Um, and always under insulated. Yeah, and maybe oh, we can an R sixty, but use a three quarter piece of plywood right here. You Batten know, the hatches, yeah. man. Batten the hatches. Maybe in the comments below, I did a, a, a beautiful article for JLC a, a while ago where we did this kind of double hatch routine. I did it with Shoreline Builders, but it. We did kind of a locking gasketed closure, and then down below it where the finished ceiling was, we just did this little pop-up panel. So you basically popped up the panel, took it down, and then you reached in the hole in the real... Cool. Yeah. Same thing we did at my personal house. We got exactly. That, we got that from you, too. Exactly. So. so. Okay. Anyways. All right. Final, any other final thoughts? No, I I mean, I, I won't wear my hat anymore. Thank you for not bashing our military today. But I uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I know. Hey, all my military friends out there. Jake's not a military basher. I'm just having fun here. Jake, uh, Jake loves our military. What are all the people that don't listen to the whole podcast? I'm still a despicable human being. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's a so, wrap on roofs. Yeah, that's the wrap on roof. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for joining us on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube as well. If you're on YouTube, click the subscribe button. Don't forget to hit the little bell at the bottom so that you get a notification Ding. each time we publish. And if you're listening on uh, iTunes or Spotify or if you're just listening to the audio, ver audio version, please go to iTunes. Leave us a five-star review. If you don't think we warrant a five-star review, you could still leave a five-star review and just use someone else's name. It's fine. <laughs> no one cares as long as we get the five-star review. That helps us reach higher points in the charts and that helps us show up and find new listeners and find uh, a bigger audience. And that's our goal. We're sharing this so that people get to hear it, not just so that we can sit around and BS all the time, although that is a quite a benefit for me. I like just hanging out and recording these. But I'd like to think I got better things to do than sit around a table with you two. It's unfortunate it, that you don't, though. It's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> I don't know if that says anything about Maybe us. Maybe I need to reassess my position. You've been able to sit around with you two, the band? Is that what you've been doing? Yeah. Holy smokes. I, mean, I, I think I need to reassess my situation as my position in the universe. And that's where we leave it. Steve on an emotional journey. Thank you. <laughs>